All right, welcome to our first video in our second unit. The first thing that we're going to talk about in this video is, well, the main thing we're going to talk about is the origin, the purpose, the function, and the evolution of political parties. Not very exciting stuff on the surface, but what we really want to do is try and boil that down instead of names and dates and labels, instead to events. And if we can focus on the purpose of what political parties do, I think it gets at least a little bit more interesting and can we, see, we can see where this is relevant. So the first thing we need to do then is define political parties. <clears throat> this is nothing complex. It's just people with a shared interest. So we have lots of examples of things that are like political parties. We have the Youth Hockey Booster Club, the Youth Baseball Club, the, um, the Show Choir Support Group. Any group of people with a shared interest in theory could be a political party. What makes it a political party is that they have a specific motivation. They focus on creating civic change. So if we look at the picture that I just put up on the right, that makes you think that this is what it is. But that's, that's not what a political party is. This is volunteerism. This is just a group of people who are working directly to improve the community. So that's not what a political party is. They don't work to volunteer and clean up parks or clean up roads or things like that. That doesn't mean that a political party couldn't get involved with that as well, but that's not their primary focus. What they're really trying to do is to create civic change by electing candidates. So they find what they think are electable people, they nominate them, they support them, and they try to get candidates. Candidates are just people who we're hoping will win an election. So they try to get candidates that represent their views and will vote on issues in a way that's reflective of the political party. These organizations are voluntary. Now there are paid individuals within them, that's at the high levels, but the vast majority of people who work with a political party are doing so on an unpaid basis. They're very, very powerful organizations in our country, primarily because they are so well structured and have so much influence through how much money they can raise. In all honesty, it's almost impossible to win a major election. I'm not talking mayor, I'm talking senator, and even in that case, state senator. It's almost impossible to win that as an independent because of the amount of money that it takes to win an election. We will talk about that when we get to the election portion of this unit, but just put it this way, to become president, you need roughly a billion dollars. And political parties can tap into people who are motivated and willing to donate money. Now, our first political parties resolve or evolved out of a single issue. We have the Articles of Confederation. They are too weak. That was on purpose because we are afraid of an abusive government. And so we have the Constitutional Convention, and our goal is to create a stronger, more unifying form of government. At this, we come up with, again, that central debate from Locke and Hobbes, which is, if we have a government, we know it will abuse power. So what best way can we have to limit that abuse? And we immediately come up with a concern about is this new constitution going to create too much power in a centralized authority, much like a king. In other words, even though there were not totalitarian regimes at the time, the concern is are we going to create a system that could turn into a totalitarian regime? So we have two groups of people. The first political party really is the Federalists. Here we see some influential names you've heard throughout history, Hamilton, Madison. And they favor a strong central government. They, they favor controlling trade. Uh, and by controlling, I just mean regulating. They favor trying to have a central organized body that can collect taxes and can unify this new nation. Because of that, they support the Constitution. They wrote many, many articles and essays on this, trying to sway the public after the Constitutional Convention. Well, we know once we have one side that favors something, we're always going to have another group of people that will disagree. The question is just how strong they are. For our purposes, at this point in time, we will refer to them as the Anti-Federalists. And we see Henry, uh, Mason, Adams. We see people who are afraid that this will consolidate power and lead to an abusive central government. We would say that we still have that concern today. Edward Snowden from 2013, where he released documents about the government's uh, national security advisory who are spying on citizens and corporations. So we still have this concern about an abusive government. Obviously, they opposed the Constitution then. They said this is going to give too much power to a small group of people. Now, contrary to today, we had a wonderful fevered debate that actually led to a compromise. And today we seem to be unable to have both of our parties compromise. 
We'll talk about that as things move along. At the time, this leads to something that we would, in general, all agree was incredibly important, which is the Bill of Rights. The Federalists promised to give the Fed Anti-Federalists a Bill of Rights outlining protections for citizens from the government if they would support the Constitution. And it was nothing more than a promise. They ratified the Constitution, and the Federalist first thing was crafting a Bill of Rights so they could trust each other. Now, we have an evolution of political parties. I don't want you to write this whole chart down. I just want to go over it briefly because I want us to understand where we came from. So we have the Federalist Party from 19... Ooh, that was a big mistake there. You see how I put 1970s? There's a little dyslexic part on my part there. 1790s to 1820. That favored the central government. So we have the first political party after the ratification of the Constitution, which is the Democratic-Republican Party, not the Anti-Federalists. But they really are the Anti-Federalists. Now, in 1825, we see a big change. And so we see a very, very polarizing figure, Andrew Jackson, come to, come to the forefront in American politics, and we have two different political parties that come about because of it. That doesn't hold. When Andrew Jackson is done, we kind of see a disillusion. And then we have the Whig Party that arises as kind of the ashes from the National Republican. And then eventually that turns into the Republican. So an easy test question, what is the oldest and still existing political party in America? And the correct answer would be the Democratic Party, which formed in 1825. So what I'd rather look at instead of that is what are these major events? This is a timeline. Don't bother zooming in. Um, don't worry about all the other stuff on there. What I thought was just, was just a nice, interesting way to visualize the changes in time about political parties. And we can see some individuals show up as major events were a divergence. So as we're looking here, we can see here's our Democratic, Republican, and Federalists. They disagree about the role of a strong central government. Oops. And then <laughs> we have them converge. And that's because the Federalists can no longer in 1820, sorry about that, can no longer field a legitimate national candidate. And so, really, James Monroe runs for president unopposed. And so now we have no political party. We just have the one, which in essence means none. Well, then we start to have some people here in 1824 diverge. And we have a very polarizing person, Andrew Jackson, who comes about. And because of him, we see a divide between no, well, the Democratic Republican Party and no opposition to the, the Democratic Party and the National Republican. And then we start to see some divergences here. Our first real event then is the election of 1820. The Federalists cannot field a candidate. So we have to know now, it, it looks all rosy. Hey, everyone agrees, but we know that can't be the case. And we quickly start having debates led by Andrew Jackson. And after the election of 1824, we start to see a divide. And now we have two parties, the Democratic and the National Republican. You should notice a theme here. Whenever we have one strong party, we will have a second party that will rise up to oppose them and give the alternative view. Now, as we look a little bit further on, we start to see some divergence again. So we move forward. Here's, here's our election of 1820. Here's Andrew Jackson. And then we see this split with the Whig Party. And so we have a bunch of different people that coalesce into the Whig Party. The National Republican kind of disappears here. We have the Democratic Party continuing strong. So we have a couple of events. The biggest one throughout all of this is the debate about slavery. So we see the Free Soil Party. We see the Know Nothing Party. What we really have is a debate about slavery. How are we going to deal with this issue? Come on, computer, you can do this. We have this big debate about this slavery issue. And what you'll notice, contrary to today, um, contrary to our, our underlying understanding, if we just go on a rudimentary level, is the Democratic Party is the party of slavery. They are the party in favor of slavery. And we have all of these different groups that are trying to figure out what they think. And this all comes to a head in 1856, which leads to what we know will be the election of Abraham Lincoln and what we then strongly anticipate in 1860 will be the Civil War. So a major event leads to the destruction of other parties and the creation of a new one. So we get through the Civil War. And we see this kind of meshing here in the liberal Republicans. Okay? And that's really trying to deal with the issue of Reconstruction. It's dealing with the Great Revival, so some social and other issues. And then our next big event comes up with the formation of the Green Party, or the Greenback Party. 
Um, those of you who have seen The Wizard of Oz can see it's considered a parable, meaning a story telling another story. And it's not completely agreed that this is the case, but it's generally thought to, which is the idea of should we have our dollars, our money, backed by gold? And so we have the Greenback Party that's focusing on this. So we see a rise of a third party, or what we would call a single-issue party. In addition, we have another single-issue party that arises in the late 1800s, which is the Prohibition Movement. That's the political party that formed around a single issue, let's get rid of alcohol. Now, from that period on, we really don't see too many changes. Here we see the Prohibition Party, and it dies, and we should know why it dies. Well, that's irritating to you. We see the Prohibition Party, and that dies, and we should know why. Here we see the Progressive Party, and we could argue the Progressive Party has come back. The populace dealt with a couple issues we're not going to worry about today. History will take care of that. But we do have the rise of socialism that I like to point out in the early 1900s, which is a political ideology. It's an economic ideology that we see give rise in the early 1900s. And it kind of dies out in America as far as with any kind of actual support around 1920. So, political parties, first of all, we should see this theme. The United States is a two-party system, a two-party system. While we've had other parties, and we do have other parties today than just the two, what really matters is these two political parties. I have them represented here as the elephant and the donkey. Each party chooses a symbol. Well, why do we have a two-party system? The first thing is it's, an e it's efficient. We know that the more choices people have, often they are paralyzed by those choices, and they don't make any choice. Why? Because there's too many options. You don't know which is the right one. And that's true on simple tasks as far as deciding and complex tasks. Freshmen, wait until you're a senior and trying to choose which college, if you're going to go to college that you're going to go to, or what career you should enter. They also provide us a two-party system, clear choices, which means clear winners and losers. We know who's in charge. Right now, who's in charge of the presidential election? Well, they're not presidential election, but the, the White House, and who is in theory then leading our government, we would say the Democratic Party, because Obama, at the time of this video, is currently the president. That allows us then to easily decide if we are happy or unhappy. And we can say, all right, if the Democrats are in charge and I think I'm doing worse than I was before, I have a clear choice, the Republicans. If I'm happy with the Democrats, then I can continue to support them. It clears up a lot of this confusion. And so what we see, unfortunately, is this polarization of political parties where their perceived role nowadays is to simply oppose the other party. I had a, uh, a state elected official at a relatively high ranking who was in class one day talking. He said, when we're not the majority, and you'll know what this means later on, when we're not the majority, we are simply working to get back to the majority. It's not about compromise. It's not about getting things done. It's about getting back into power. And you can see where this becomes destructive. In today's political climate, I don't think we could ever get a Bill of Rights because they don't, the political parties don't work like that. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that those, those are considered the major parties. That doesn't mean there aren't other parties. Our first is considered third parties. Here we have some examples. The Independent Party, the Reform Party, the Libertarian Party. And these are, are parties that come up with kind of a theme. They come up with a central maybe core beliefs, and if they have good ideas, one of the big parties will steal them. We see this with the, the Tea Party. <clears throat> Pardon me. The Tea Party came to power, um, I would say, in the late 2000s, so 2009, 2010, that kind of era, and it gained a lot of steam basically opposing what was going on with big government spending, um, invasion of... Uh, states' rights by the major parties, so we see a revival of anti-federalist movement. You can see that in their symbol here. And what happened is the Republicans really quickly glommed on and said, hey, we're not exactly like you, but boy, we're closer to you than the Democrats are, and so you should vote with us. We also have ideological parties. So there is a Communist Party of America. Ideological means we think about things in a specific way, and they're trying to create some kind of major social change throughout their party. The biggest time we saw this would be with the Socialist Party in the early 1900s, as we saw the robber barons and this rise of the fabulous wealth, and people were looking at a way to, to correct that. <clears throat> we saw those ideas then co-opted by other parties. We saw some, 
some major third parties rise up around some of those ideas. And the last one is single issue parties. So a quick check here, what political party do you think a camel represents? Okay, a camel represents an ability to not drink. And so these are uh, parties that rise around a single social change. So in this case, the, the Prohibition Party. They want a single issue <clears throat> that they will address and everything else comes secondary. The key with these parties is they typically dissolve once their goal has been met. So we saw the Prohibition Party strong and then disappear. Well, guess what? The Prohibition Party still exists today. It's just not very powerful. All right. Have a good day.